Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. Okay, good morning. I too wanted to mention and thank all of you who have taken part in VBS this year. John stole my thunder. But we are very grateful to all of you. Um, even if you didn't really do anything other than attend, we're grateful uh, that you attended and supported the work that took place this past week. Our theme was Bible Base Camp Lessons from on High. And we looked at different stories from the Bible that took place on mountains. And we drew lessons from those stories. Yeah. <laughs> These sermons I preach are eventually put up on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, we're not filming on location. Um, <laughs> This is one of the decorations from VBS. You might remember one of the stories from Costa Rica this past year of how we got up real early one morning and we went to a mountain because they said you could, the sunrise was beautiful on the top of that mountain and the taxi driver could take us right up to the top. And we got there and he couldn't take us right up to the top, but it's only a half hour walk. And so we started walking and I didn't make it very far. And so, I made it to the top of a mountain now. And that is the only mountain I'll ever probably make it to the top of. As a way of winding up the week, I thought it might be good to do a lesson on Mount Zion. The mountain we're talking about today, it is a, a mountain over in Israel, a physical mountain, but as we think about this, we're going to see that the physical mountain has come to stand for something spiritual as well. It's a symbolic mountain, and this symbolic or spiritual, I guess we should say, Mount Zion is more important than anything else in the world. It's more important than any other institution that exists in the world. And of course, we're going to give a bit of a spoiler here, but I think you already know this. Mount Zion is a reference to the church that Jesus died to establish. And we know, of course, that, that that church is also described as a kingdom by Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, when he's speaking to Peter, he says to Peter, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on uh, this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you, to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There in verse 18, he says, I'm going to build my church. But then in verse 19, Jesus refers to that church as the kingdom of heaven. And so keep that in mind as we begin to uh, study this passage here in Daniel, and also we're going to look at a passage in Isaiah. I also want to say that as I was writing this sermon, it kept getting longer and longer and longer, and so it's a two-parter. And so if you can't make it back tonight, you're really only going to hear half a sermon this week. So I hope that you can make it back tonight to hear the conclusion of this sermon. We're really, this morning, sort of just laying some groundwork for the main point that we're going to be delivering tonight. And this morning again, what we're going to do is look at some passages from Daniel and also uh, from the book of Isaiah that reference the mountain of the Lord or Mount Zion. So first, we begin with Daniel. Now, the book of Daniel takes place uh, during the start or, or during the, the high point of the Babylonian Empire. King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has taken many of the Jews captive back to Babylon with him. And among those was Daniel. 
So Daniel is living in captivity in Babylon, and Daniel himself is uh, what they considered one of the wise men. Okay? Now Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he can't remember what that dream was. But he has a bunch of wise men in his kingdom, and so he goes to the wise men and says, I've had a dream, I want you to tell me the dream. And they say, well, king, we'll be glad to do that. Just tell us your dream and we'll give you the interpretation. Well, he tells these wise men, if you're really so wise, tell me the dream. And then tell me the interpretation. Because he didn't even remember for sure what the dream was. And of course, the wise men could not answer him. And they, they were not able to do that. If he had got, given them the dream, they could have come up with some kind of interpretation, but they couldn't guess what the dream was. And so Nebuchadnezzar made up his mind that he was going to kill all the wise men in Babylon. Well, Daniel hears about that. And Daniel then goes to the king and reveals to the king what that dream was. Now, we already read part of Daniel 2, but an earlier part is when Daniel describes the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel 2, 31 to 35. He says, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And then notice the statement. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. We want to focus in on, as we think about this, we want to focus in on that stone that was cut out without hands. This stone in the image, in the dream, is said to have striked the image in the feet. The feet that were made partly of iron and partly of clay, and that, that the image is then destroyed by this stone, and then this stone becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. Well, John read for us, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't advance the slides. John read for us Daniel 2, 37 to 44, which was, uh, Daniel's the new interpre interpretation of the dream that he had just given to Nebuchadnezzar. So we're not going to reread all of that now because it was just read in your hearing. But what Daniel tells him in summary is this. This image that Nebuchadnezzar saw represented four different kingdoms. The head of gold on this image represented Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom, Babylon. The chest and arms of silver represented another kingdom that was going to come after his. And history tells us that the next kingdom to come along were the Medes and Persians after the Babylonian kingdom. The belly and thighs of bronze represent a third kingdom. And then um, the, and Daniel says that this kingdom would rule over all the earth. Well, that was the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great, who did conquer all the known world at that time. And then we have legs of iron and feet of iron and clay mixed together. That represented a fourth kingdom that was as strong as iron, but the clay was representative of the fact that there was a weakness about this kingdom. We're talking then about the Roman Empire, which came after the Grecian Empire. And this weakness in the Roman Empire is a reference to the fact that Rome would conquer a nation and then basically allow them to continue on as normal as long as they paid taxes to Rome. And so these conquered nations had no allegiance to Rome. Um, they viewed Rome simply as a conqueror whom they had to give a bunch of money to. 
Uh, so there was no allegiance to Rome. Now you see Babylon and the Medes and Persians were a little bit different. When they conquered a place, they took the people and scattered them. And then often resettled the area with their own people. And so that there wasn't that problem. But the Romans allowed these people to continue to, to live and to worship as they pleased. As long as they paid taxes. And so that was the weakness that is described. So it says there's a stone that breaks the image into pieces. And that that stone that does that is a kingdom that God was going to establish. And notice in verse 44 of, of our passage there. Um, it says in the days of these kings. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The days of what king? Well, the days of the kings of this fourth kingdom, the Roman kingdom, the Roman Empire. During the time of the Roman Empire, God is going to set up a kingdom. And that kingdom is represented by this stone that was cut without hands. What does that mean, a stone that is cut without hands? I think that is um, symbolic of the fact that this kingdom that was going to be established by God, it wasn't an earthly kingdom, it wasn't a physical kingdom, but rather a spiritual kingdom. We know that the kingdom of Christ is spiritual in nature and not physical. In John 18 and verse 36, he says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, my kingdom is a spiritual kingdom in nature. It's not a kingdom like people usually think of a kingdom. And so this stone then in the, in the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has, it turns into a mountain that fills the whole earth. And that, again, in reference to the church, is symbolizing the fact that this church, this kingdom that was going to be established, was going to grow and eventually fill the whole earth. And we, we read in the Bible that during the lifetime of the Apostle Paul, he says this gospel has gone to every creature. Colossians 1, 5 through 6, Paul says, Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, notice, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit. And so the word of God had, by the time of even the Apostle Paul, it had gone forth into all the world and the church grew. Now, the influence of the church is what destroyed these other kingdoms. You look at the Roman Empire, it was built upon the um, Grecian Empire, which was built upon the Medes and Persian, and that was built upon the Babylonian Empire. And, and the influence of the church really was the downfall of the Roman Empire the influence of Christianity. And so we have this stone cut without hands, turning into a great mountain that fills the whole earth, a reference to the kingdom of Christ, which is his church. Now let's go to Isaiah. I want to look at a couple prophecies in Isaiah about the mountain of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, we read, now just for dating purposes, Isaiah wrote around 750 B.C., okay? It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So Isaiah starts this off by talking about the mountain of the Lord's house. That it's going to be established in the top of the mountains. Well the Lord's house is a reference to the Lord's church. In 1 Timothy 3 and 15 we have Paul telling us. Telling Timothy. Uh, if I am delayed I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God. Which is the church of the living God. And so when Isaiah says the mountain of the Lord's house is going to be established in the top of the mountains, he's talking about the church for the church is the house of God. Now, why would Isaiah refer to the church as a mountain, the mountain of the Lord's house? Well, there are a lot of mountain 
mountains are very symbolic and they, they, they represent a lot of things. But when you think about a mountain, you think about something that is permanent. Okay, something that is, it, it, it pretty much has always been there. You know, somebody might try to argue that, you know, we can destroy mountains. But I'm, for the most part, mountains are permanent. You know, we can't remove a mountain. Mountains are large. Mountains are impressive. And they're beautiful to behold. And so the mountain of the Lord's house, talking about the church, I believe is referencing its permanence, its, uh, its size, that it would grow and to fill the whole earth. And the, and the church is impressive. It, bring, it displays the wisdom and glory of God. So this mountain, or the church, is said to be exalted above the hills. Well, what are the hills and what does that mean? Well, again, as I said in my introduction, the church is more important than any other earthly institution. And so this mountain of the Lord's house, the church being exalted above the hills, is a reference to the fact that the church is more important, more exalted than every earthly institution, whether we're talking about governments or um, other false religions or whatever it might be, this institution is exalted above all of those. And we're told also that all nations would flow into this house, this mountain of the Lord's house. And of course, that is a reference to the fact that the gospel is for all mankind, both Jew and Gentile, all are, uh, all flow into that church. Now this mountain of the Lord's house was going to be established in the top of the mountains. Now that's interesting. That top of the mountains is a reference then to a city, and that city is Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem was considered to be the top of the mountains. And the passage then says, Out of Zion shall go forth the law. Zion, it's the word Zion itself is a reference to the city of Jerusalem. We know that. Um, back in 2 Samuel chapter 5, we have David um, going to the city that we now call Jerusalem. And at that time it was called Salem, but it, the Jebusites were living there. And they had never driven the Jebusites out of Jerusalem when they came into the promised land. And so David goes to conquer that city. And in verses uh, 2 Samuel 5, 6, and 7, King and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. It says, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And so, the word of the Lord shall go forth from Zion, or out of Zion shall go forth the law. That's a reference to Jerusalem. Now, Something to remember about Jerusalem. Jerusalem then, after David conquers it, one day the temple is going to be built there. And then once the temple is built there, the presence of God arrives there. Look at 1 Kings chapter 8. This is a lengthy 11 verses, but this is a description of the finishing of the temple and bringing the ark into the most holy place, and then God's presence arriving. And this is important, really, for tonight, as we begin to talk about spiritual Zion. It says, Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. Therefore all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is in the seventh month. So all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. Then they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. The priests and the Levites brought them up. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. Then the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark, 
and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside. And they are there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass, when the priests came out of the holy place, notice, the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And so as we think about Zion, and that word being used here to describe the physical city of Jerusalem, at this point, uh, the presence of God is there at Jerusalem, the mercy seat. That's what we call the top of the ark, where those angels were on top of the ark and their, in, their wings were stretching forward to one another as they were facing one another. That's called the mercy seat. And that is where the symbolic presence of God would dwell. And so in Zion here, we have the symbolic dwelling place of God which here during the time of the dedication of the temple, there actually was a, a physical presence there in the form of this cloud. Uh, the glory of God filled the temple. So that is Isaiah 2. And we want to remember then that uh, the church is described as the mountain of the Lord's house, that it was going to be established in Jerusalem and that the word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem. We'll see the fulfillment of that in our sermon this evening. There's another prophecy in the book of Isaiah that I want to read that also refers to the church as, as a mountain. And that's in Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10. Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Um, here's the key verse. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Now as we think about this passage, and we could spend probably three or four sermons dissecting this prophecy here. There is a rod from the stem of Jesse. That is simply a reference to Christ. Saying that Christ was going to come through Jesse, who was the father of David. In other words, Jesus was going to be a descendant of Jesse. And, and so there, that is what is referenced there in the first few verses. In verses 2 through 5 of our passage describe Jesus, this stem or, uh, of Jesse, this branch. The Spirit of the Lord is said to rest upon him and that his delight would be in the fear of the Lord. He's not going to judge by the sight of his eyes. In other words, he's going to judge righteous judgment. Remember, Jesus taught... Don't judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And he will judge with, with righteousness and with equity. And that he would strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And that he would be righteous and faithful. And so all of these terms are descriptions of Jesus. But then in verses 6 through 10 of our passage, we have a description of the kingdom. 
that was going to be established. And we have numerous pictures there of prey dealing with, uh, dwelling with predators and doing so without fear and without harm, doing so in peace. And that's what verse 9 summarizes. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. There are people who, are, who read this passage and think that it is referencing something still in our future. Some kind of thousand year kingdom that Jesus is going to establish someday when he comes back. But I'm here to tell you that this prophecy has already been fulfilled, is being fulfilled as we speak in his church. His church is a kingdom of peace, a church where we're all equal in Christ. And if we're living and behaving as we should, we, we treat one another like we want to be treated. It's a kingdom of peace and of happiness. And so we have here in Daniel and Isaiah references to the mountain of the Lord's house. In, uh, in Daniel, it's, the church is referenced as a stone that strikes the image and then grows into a mountain. And that stone is the kingdom that's going to be established in the days of the Roman Empire, the church. We'll talk about that tonight. And in Isaiah, we have the mountain of the Lord's house being established in Jerusalem at the top of the mountains. And here in Isaiah chapter 11, we have an example of the fact that this kingdom that was going to be established that this mountain, this holy mountain, which is a reference to the church, would be a kingdom of peace. We're going to look at tonight uh, the establishment of the church and how it, it fulfills these prophecies in Daniel and in Isaiah. And then we're going to look tonight in a passage in Hebrews chapter 12 that talks about Mount Zion, that we've come to Mount Zion. And we hope that you can be here tonight for the conclusion of the lesson. As we uh, wrap up this sermon this morning, as we've already said, the church is the most important institution that exists in this world. It is more important than anything else that exists. And the question then that we have is, are you a, a part of that church? Have you been added to that church by Christ? In Acts 2 and verse 47, we read the Lord adds to the church daily those who are being saved. So have you? Have you been saved from your sins? Well, what do we have to do to be saved from our sins? Well, Jesus said that we have to believe in him. In John 8, 24, he said, If you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. He also said in Luke 13, 3, that if we don't repent, we'll perish or turn from our sins. He tells us in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, that if we don't confess him before men, he won't confess us before the Father. And we have in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. What do we have to do to be saved? Believe, repent, confess, and be baptized that our sins might be washed away. And then continue to live faithfully. Friend, as we can conclude our lesson this morning, if you've not yet done those things, we're going to sing a song. And if you would like to confess your faith in Christ and be baptized, having made the commitment to repent of your sins and live faithfully the rest of your life, we can do that this very morning and bring you into Christ, into the church, wherein you'll be saved from your sins. If you've already obeyed the gospel but have become unfaithful, then you need to repent. Turn from your sins and ask God's forgiveness, and he will grant it. So as we sing the invitation song, if any need to respond, we invite you to come as we stand and as we Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.